two. This is a continuation of the teaching of six things that the Lord doth hate. Six things that the Lord doth hate. At this time, we've gotten up to feet that be sh swift in running to mischief. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. Mischief plainly defined is playful misbehavior, and that's one that we often hear from young children, perhaps, mischief. Uh, but the more focused one that I see in the scriptures more often is harm or trouble caused by someone or some thing. It's a misfortune or it's a distress. In Genesis chapter 42, in verse 1, it says, Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do ye look one upon another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither, and buy for us from thence, that we may live and not die. And Joseph's brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren. For he said, lest peradventure mischief befall him. Over in verse 36, it says, And Jacob their father said unto him, Me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not. And you will take Benjamin away? All these things are against me. And Reuben spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons, if I bring him not unto thee. Deliver him into my, my hand, and I will bring him to thee again. And he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in which ye go, then will ye bring down my gray hairs with sorrow unto the grave. There the Bible connects in verse 36, uh, very early on in the book of Genesis, which I love using Genesis to describe terms. This is why we went to the first mention of the word mischief. We see in verse 36 in the middle, Joseph is not. And down in verse 38 in the middle, it says his brother is dead. Is not meaning is dead. Those two connecting very clearly. And he says he is left alone if mischief befall him, by the way. And he talks about how his great mourning would happen. Mischief here, then, is the fact that Joseph is not Simeon is not. They are dead. And we know that the Bible does teach that they weren't, in fact, dead. But these are the worries, these are the concerns of one Jacob at this time, that he would lose his children. They would be not. And that is the mischief that would fall. See, God likens mischief to a few things. He likens it unto one being slain in Exodus chapter 32 and verse 12. Also in Deuteronomy 32 verse 23, he says, A fire is kindled in my anger. I will heap up mischief upon them. I will spend my arrows upon them. So mischief here, from God's perspective, as he puts it out, is him using his arrows. It is him initiating his anger upon his enemies. In 1 Samuel chapter 23, we find that Saul here presents himself in one way face to face, in one way face to face to David, but the Bible records in 1 Samuel 23 that Saul secretly practiced mischief against that same David. He secretly practiced mischief, and we know that Saul was wont to and oftentimes throw javelins at David. He was one that planned to hurt David, planned to harm David, planned to trouble David, planned to use his anger in slaying David. That is the mischief the Bible talks about. And feet that be swift into running to mischief, feet that be swift in running to mischief, is one of the things that the Lord doth hate. We find very outward presently mischief ideas. We find the hurt, the harm, the attempted murders even as an outward show. But quite often the worst form of mischief we find is exactly what Saul represented, what Saul showed. And that is presenting him one way to the face but secretly practicing mischief. It's almost worse when someone secretly practices mischief towards somebody. And this is something new that one would secretly practice mischief against People, especially against the Lord's people. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. The Bible says, Why do the heathen rage? 
cry to the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. This is then the heathen acting out their mischief upon the believers, upon the Lord and upon his anointed or his chosen ones. They are devising, they are behind the scenes counseling, they are working out their mischief behind closed doors and what they are saying is let us break their bands asunder. Let us cast away their cords from us. Let us free ourselves of the Lord. Let us free ourselves from his people. And this is what the heathen discuss in secret, privately, as they imagine this vain thing. But fear not, believer. Don't be worried. Don't fret about such things. The Lord hates such as devise wicked imaginations. The Lord hates such as imagine vain things. The Lord hates such that have feet that are swift in running to mischief, even as these heathen do. And he has a recompense for them. Look in verse 4, it says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Yeah. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. So while we're down here worrying about the heathen raging and devising vain things behind the scenes about how they can remove our cords from them, how they can rid themselves of us, God is in heaven laughing. God is in heaven mocking when their fear cometh. And that's exactly what happens when the Lord speaks, when the Lord vexes them in his sore displeasure, when they finally see the wrath of the Lord, then their sudden uh, mischief becomes nothing. In fact, the Bible teaches, and we'll get there, that their own mischief falleth upon themselves. God can manage. God can take care of those that are after and planning mischief against his anointed. Verse 8 says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Ask him. Call it to me and ask. Ask, ask, ask is what God is constantly saying. He have not because he ask not. And as the wicked, as the rulers, as they take counsel against God and his chosen people, God simply laughs and says, my people, just ask and I'll give you them. Ask and I will destroy them. I will vex them in my displeasure. I will show them their, uh, my wrath upon them. Praise be to God that we can cry unto him and he can manage our greatest worries, our greatest woes, our greatest fears. Look across in Psalm chapter 7 and verse 9. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end. Again, here is God's people. Here is the chosen ones crying out to the Lord. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end. But establish the just. For the righteous God trieth the heart's and reigns. My defense is of God, which saveth the upright in heart. God judgeth the righteous. God is angry with the wicked every day. If he turn not, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bows and made it ready. He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordained his arrows against the persecutors. Behold, he travaileth with iniquity and hath conceived mischief and brought forth falsehood. He made a pit and digged it, and has fallen into the ditch which he hath made. His mischief shall return upon his own head. His violent dealings shall come down upon his own path. I will praise the Lord according to his righteous, and will sing praise to the name of the Most High. And that's what we ought to do. We ought to rejoice. We ought to sing praises unto the Most High as he takes and judges, yes, the just, and yes, the righteous, but turns his wrath upon the wicked to rise through defense to his own. Praise him for that. As the wicked and as the mischievous plans, as the pit was digged by those that are against the Lord and against his anointed, the, those mischievous dealers fall into their own pits and their own mischief falls upon them. The thing that we see in this world is that mischief coming from the outward and in is something that can attack the Christian in two ways. 
It either comes outward and very, and very strong and physical, and in that manifestation you can see it, it's very plain. Somebody coming at you with a weapon, somebody coming at you with a sword, someone coming at you with fists, with, to do you harm outwardly and physical. That's one way you can see mischief. You know, that, that is Saul casting the javelin at David. But it also comes in that subtle way. That's the secret practicing of mischief that Saul did. Whereby he tried to move the goalpost. He tried to orchestrate things. He tried to manipulate situations in order that judgment would fall upon David. In order that David would be hurt in mischief. And we see the same thing in our world. We know that the religion of Islam is one where it is, when it is in great power, as it is in much of the Middle East... It rules with an iron fist. It has, it has everybody under its domain. You must submit to Islam or else death is certain. But we know that Islam behaves in those two forms whereby when it's in power, yes, it is like that. It's very in your face. It's very prevalent. 100% of that nation will be taken over and those that, those that rise up against it will be put down to death. But Islam also behaves itself when it's in the minority as a subtle serpent. It will appear as an angel of righteousness. It will appear to be an, a religion of peace. It will be your friend at work. It will be your, your co-worker. It will be somebody that you can speak to on a regular basis. And that religion has done this time after time after time to once, once the tides start to shift, once, once the, uh, the balance starts to lean their way and they become one that is higher in power, one that is greater than numbers, then they change and suddenly they start to enforce their mischief by harm and by hurt and by an outward show of it. We saw also this in, in the Roman Empire in the Dark Ages, whereby the Catholic Church was going about slaying and murdering and torturing and by inquisition seeking to pull people out of their homes and out of their lifestyle, out of where they were at, in order to force them to convert, force them to recant their Christ, force them to submit to the Roman Empire. They did that in the Dark Ages. But we also see now the exact opposite, whereby in Fourth Kingdom Babylon that we now presently live in, uh, it's much more subtle. There is a subversion. There is a propaganda push. There is a, 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 a quiet law that is often in force in order to cause mischief, in order to run to mischief, in order to put mischief upon God's people. Psalm chapter 28 and verse 3 highlights this. Psalm 28 and verse 3 says, Draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their heart. So they are speaking peace. They're crying, peace, peace. When the Bible says it's very clear that there is no peace. They're saying, we are a peaceful people. We are a, a jovial people. We are kind people. We're here to do you good. But mischief is always in their hearts. They speak one thing, they devise another. And this is probably the most dangerous of enemies. This is as Satan coming in the grass, in the Garden of Eden, where he would seem to be quoting God's word. He would seem to be one that was relatable to the woman. He would seem to be uh, um, someone that was bringing her good, offering her that she could be as God, something good, bringing peace. But in the heart was devising something completely and entirely different. But either form of mischief that the wicked would put upon the people of God, God therefore always has an answer. And we see that as you read down in verse 4. It says, give them according to their deeds. And according to the wickedness of their endeavors, give them after the work of their hands. Render to them their desert, because they regard not the works of the Lord, nor the operation of his hands. He shall destroy them and not build them up. Blessed be the Lord, because he hath heard the voice of my supplications. And again, blessed be the God that finds his people crying out to him when they need something. Crying out to him when they are oppressed. Crying out to him when the workers of iniquity are practicing mischief upon them. And he hears and he enforces his own will upon them. And their own mischief falls upon themselves. So be warned then, ye rulers. Be warned then, ye folks that are trying to to practice mischief, trying to devise mischief, whether it's in this congregation, whether it's in your hometown, whether it's in your own houses, whether if you are one that is trying to put down God's anointed, trying to put down and fight against 
God himself. Be warned, ye rulers that devise mischief on your beds. Be warned, those that secretly practice mischief within their houses. Be warned, heathen that rage and imagine vain things against the Lord. He is laughing at you. He is mocking, and he will be mocking when your fear cometh. Be warned, those that against his anointed have imagined mischief and practiced mischief and seek to do mischief because they are his chosen, as the word anointed translates to in the scriptures and a synonym of it. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3 says, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed, giving the promise unto Abraham that Christ would come. And thereby those that are in Christ would receive the same promises. Faithful Abraham, those who are in Christ, would have that promise put upon them that anyone that curses them would be cursed. And anyone, praise God, that blesses Christians would be blessed. You want to try to dispensationalize this out. You want to try to dispose of this scripture and make it apply to somebody else. The reasoning about, that they do with those that kind of scripture, with, with Genesis chapter 12, and try to make it an Abrahamic covenant or something that will not apply to a believer today. Their reasonings are so foolish that I can respond with a simple song. Every promise in the book is mine, every chapter and every verse and every line. Okay? I don't need to come at them with scripture. The whole Bible tells them they're wrong. We can even go to 1 Peter where it says clearly, it says not seeds as of many, but of one. And that seed was Christ. So those that are in Christ receive of the same promise of faithful Abraham. And that same promise is this. If someone curses a Christian, they will be cursed. If someone blesses a Christian, they will be blessed. But here we're talking about those that practice mischief against the Lord and against his anointed. <clears throat> The current state that we have here in Canada is one where the rulers are practicing mischief against the Lord and against his anointed. It does not take you long in listening and hearing what's going on to realize this. I know that if you were on Facebook, you will see that anti-vaccination uh, things are being blocked. Anti-abortion messages are being blocked. An Anti-homo messages are being blocked. But we may say to ourselves, as the government also will say, well, this is a private company and Facebook is free to block whomsoever they will. They're free to serve whomsoever they will. They're free to cater to whomsoever they will. Well, let's talk about the, the, uh, the, the Christian bakers that aren't allowed to serve cakes to whomsoever they will, that are forced by, by, by criminal punishment to make cakes for them. But I relent. Fine, Facebook is its own private company and they're free to do whatever they will. That's fine. But here in Canada, the government encourages and the government does the same thing. And they do it in a broader spectrum because they're doing it to all of us. Here's one such example. Pastor Steven Anderson being banned from Canada. Okay. You may not agree with his preaching. You may not agree with his stance. You may not agree with certain things that he believes and preaches and teaches. But the man came here to soul it, and he is a Baptist preacher. And so whether you agree with him 100% or you don't agree with him 100%, you need to recognize that a Baptist preacher was banned from Canada. At the basis level of understanding of what's happening here, a preacher of the gospel has been banned from this country. There is a voice that's being silenced, and that voice is in opposition to the powers that be. And they have practiced mischief by doing something as simple as banning a preacher from Canada. How many people do you think come across the border every day that are vile, criminals, disgusting, yeah. filthy people? And then a man tries to enter into our country and just say an opinion. And just say what the Word of God says. And just tell the truth and it, based on his own understanding. At the basis level, it's just somebody talking. And we're going to ban somebody for their words? Are you kidding me? This is just one of the ways that they have enforced, by a law, their mischief. Another that just recently happened, this, this film, Unplanned. I haven't seen the movie. Best I understand is that it's a woman who is a Catholic, okay, and that's probably the worst thing about the story. But you see in this movie um, very graphic depictions of her life. She worked at Planned Parenthood. She grew up in all that, in all that way. She was the manager. She was making great money as an executive. And when she finally one day stepped back, you know, she had done abortions. She had been, been through them and that sort of thing. She worked at a Planned Parenthood. <clears throat> 
She realized one day in witnessing by an ultrasound what actually happens in the womb. She actually saw a child that was about to be hurt and harmed and mutilated by the doctor kick back and move away from the tools as they entered into its special place. And this woman witnessed that and it was so horrific that she quit the job, she left the business, she moved away, she didn't want anything to do with it and began to voice, began to cry out and tell people what she had experienced there, okay? And so she made this movie and it's been a great hit and this States and it's, it's been in theaters and people are changing their minds. They are seeing the graphic details. They're seeing the truth of what happens in these filthy clinics and these disgusting, perverted, satanic, wicked buildings whereby doctors would do such a thing to harm a child. And it's banned from Canada. So this movie is being played in, in theaters in America. It's, it's actually helping reach people and have people understand, change their mind. Hey, if 20 people in all of America don't get an abortion tomorrow because they saw this movie, praise the Lord. Amen. But Canada, you're not even going to be allowed to see this movie. It's going to be banned. And last I heard, they're not even going to let the DVDs come across. Not just from the theaters and the public showing. They're going to ban the DVD. We're going to have to somehow run this as some underground railroad and distribute it if we really wanted people to see it. Why? Because it does not fit with the status quo because they're practicing mischief against God's people. <coughs> against people in general. Whereby they would withhold something like that. It had great popularity. It was doing a great truth. It had great results. And Canada says, no, nope, not happening. Banned. The next one that we see is the religious freedom to all MDs. I don't know if you've heard about this. But recently, medical doctors have had their religious freedoms withheld from them if they're going to continue in their practice. I'm going to read just a quick article here. It's from a, a popular news, news uh, <clears throat> thing. It says, in a unanimous decision released Wednesday, the Court of Appeal for Ontario reaffirmed the lower court's conclusion that it was reasonable limit on the religious freedom of doctors to require them to connect their patients with willing providers of medical assistance in death and other contentious health services. So that's, that's helping people commit their suicide at the end of their death. Three years ago, this became legal here in Canada. Vulnerable patients seeking MAID, or that medical assistance in dying, abortion, contraception, and other aspects of sexual health care turn to their family physicians for advice, care, and if necessary, medical treatment or intervention. And this was Chief Justice George Strathy. He wrote this. Given the importance of family physicians as gatekeepers and patient navigators in the healthcare system, there is compelling evidence that patients will suffer harm in the absence of an effective referral. This means that they are saying that the patient that goes to their doctor, who is a Christian, is going to suffer harm. Why? Because they can't have help in killing themselves. Why? Because they can't have help in killing their babies. Why? Because they can't have help in practicing safe fornication. So they go to their doctor and the government has said and stated, chief justices even, has said that these people are being harmed because they can't do all these wicked things because their doctor says, nope, I'm not doing it. I'm not touching that. I'm not going to refer you to a doctor that will kill your baby. I'm not going to refer you to a doctor. It, 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 it transcends even them doing the act. They're trying to enforce that they must point them to someone who will. The Court of Appeal for Ontario is now the highest court in the country to have ruled on this thorny question of how doctors' conscience rights should be balanced against the rights of the patients to access publicly funded health services. Around the time that this was implemented, it says <clears throat> that physicians who refused to provide assisted deaths were obliged to meaningfully, in other words, with results, connect their patients with doctors who would. So if the doctor says, eh, I'm not doing it, they have to, by law now, point them to someone who will. So in other words, they're requiring these Christian doctors who have a conscience about such cases to point them to a doctor, to lay hands on another doctor, to be partakers of another doctor's sins 
and actually allow, just be a through way for their patients to still get what they want. And it continues on and says, you know, there, there's these different ladies and women and people that are just saying that this is such a great thing. We think this represents a real victory for patients' rights and equitable access to all these things in Ontario. And what it's effectively doing is it's removing any possibility that there would be an MD with any kind of morals in the future step into this field. Think about it. We are going to have nothing but filthy, perverted, reprobate doctors. There's going to be nothing but people that will gladly give you an abortion, that will gladly uh, help you kill yourself, that will gladly give you all the contraceptives you want, that will gladly, without a conscience, do all these things. And the law has enforced that anyone who does have a conscience in such a situation will be forced to at least pass you on, lay hands on, to be partakers of the other man's sins that would do such a thing. This is how mischief is being framed within Canada. This is how the government is slowly intruding on the beliefs and the morals of the Christian world. And the ones who are really standing up for it right now, the ones that they're talking about, yeah, it's mostly, it's mostly Catholics that are doctors, or it's mostly, you know, because there's these great big Catholic institutions, um, Catholic hospitals and that sort of thing. And those are the ones that are standing for it. But there are probably still Bible-believing physicians who want to run their practice and in a Bible-believing way, and they're not allowed to do it anymore. What's happening and what's going to happen is that essentially they may have 10 people that are, are good patients of theirs, and they've cared for them for a long time, and they're always leading them the right way. I had a doctor that was like this, that would, would never go with the medicine, that would never go with the intervention, that would always try to give you some sort of natural understanding of it, that would always try to, try to really help you to do things a, a, a more righteous way. Um, and, and what was pro-life and was all these sort of things. But they're making that those guys will be, will be out and then the one will, that, that will do all these things will be in there. And the, the patients, essentially it's just gonna come to this. They'll have their patients, their normal patients, they'll just take one that'll come and ask this. They won't give it and their practice will be removed from them. This effectively removes the possibility of any MD with morals continuing to practice like this. All doctors, like I said, will eventually be filthy, Reprobates. And think about it. How long is it until these same doctors are taking somebody that is a Christian and diagnosing them with some sort of mental illness, some sort of mental problem? And Christianity becomes a disease, and the only medication that can be prescribed, well, they're already killing babies. They're, they're, they're already helping people be put to death for the sake of mercy. How long until they're, they're talking to families saying, look, 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 your, your, your son, he's a Christian, he's lost his mind, he can't be fixed. The best thing that we can do for your son now is to just put him to death. No, that, that's the future of this, this way. That, that's how this, this story um, unfolds itself. You get to the point where if all the doctors have no moral conscience, have no moral guidelines, how can you even go see a doctor as a believer for just something simple? When they're going, to, they're going to try to clinicalize and give you medicine and give you drugs and give you all sorts of things that are perverted and wrong and wicked and their mind is defiled, what are you going to do as a Christian? What are you going to do as a believer? Mischief is being practiced here in Canada behind the scenes. They're framing mischief by a law. This reminds me of Daniel chapter 6. If we remember Daniel chapter 6, you can read it later, where the, the court in Aram, Daniel, was jealous of him. He was made the highest within the land. But they could not find any occasion against this Daniel, except they find it concerning him and his God, concerning the law of his God, concerning his living before his God. The only way that they could find fault in him was regarding how he lived before God. So they framed mischief by a law. They made it so that what Daniel did on a regular basis before his Lord became illegal overnight. What was the law that they implemented? They implemented that for a time, the only person who could be sought for prayer, the only person that could be sought for counsel was the King Supreme. He became the God to whom all had to call out upon. And Daniel, as he was always wont to do, kicked his door open, kicked his window open, and prayed unto the Most High God. And they found fault with him. Why? Not because he had done anything wrong, but because they framed mischief by law. They did harm to him by changing the goalposts. Suddenly what he was doing was no longer legal. And therefore, they were able to enact the law. And the law here was bow, pray to the king, or be put to death. And we know that Daniel was thrown into the lion's den for this. 
The other one that I'm reminded of, and this is future tense, is Revelation chapter 13. That no man might buy nor sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. A mark that will be instituted whereby if you don't have it, you don't buy, you don't sell. You don't engage in commerce. You are not able to purchase food. You're not able to go on the bus. You're not able to do all sorts of things in society unless you have the mark. That person didn't do anything. They didn't change what they were doing. They just simply did not get on board with the new law. And what was the law that was enforced? Worship the beast or be killed. Worship the beast or be killed. And now what we have, yes, it's a little bit tamer, but it's one of these baby step things. Now we have a culture whereby, well, don't say this. Don't, don't believe that. Don't practice this. And what is currently the penalty? Well, it's not death, but it's, it's be ostracized. It's be ridiculed. It's be blocked from social media outlets. It's be, it's be put off as a byword as far as society is concerned. But as you can see, just given some of the things that I've, I've mentioned here, including the preacher being blocked, including uh, that unplanned movie being banned, including the religious freedoms of medical doctors being removed, all of these things are leading to the road and leading down in a direction whereby they will be able to frame mischief by a law. They will be able to harm Christians and they haven't even done anything wrong. I will step out of my house one day the same as I always do a criminal. That's right. Nothing has changed. I, I'm, I'm, I pray in the morning. I, I, I read my Bible in the morning. I get up. I, I get in my truck. And I'm a criminal just for doing it. The next steps is that is that is that they'll take that what's a crime and they'll begin to enforce it. They'll begin to implement. It. They'll begin to make it worldwide. Perhaps the mark will be something that's very visible, and my neighbors will call me out. My family will call me out, and I'll be deemed as one that is sick, sick in the head. And what will they do? Take it off, right? That's the future, and it's coming bit by bit, ounce by ounce, moment by moment to this country. They're framing mischief by the law, and the Lord hates them. The Lord hates such as frame as mischief. The Lord hates that such that have feet that are swift in running to the same mischief. The Bible says the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will thinketh that he do God service. This push at the end is going to be a religious one. The mark of the beast is going to be one that requires worship. It's going to be a beast. He's going to be the antichrist. It's going to be something that looks very Christian. And so a lot of people are going to wonder what in the world. Why are you not standing with this? Why? Because all of the nominal Baptists, all of the Presbyterians, all the Pentecostals, all of the Muslims, the, the Hindus, the, the Mormons, everyone's going to be rallying behind this guy except the Bible believers who understand that no, this is the antichrist. And they're going to wonder why. And this is why it's going to be so easy to portray to everybody that this is a sickness. There's something wrong with you. What's wrong with you, Josh? You've been preaching Jesus all the time. Lo, here he is in the field. Lo, here he is in the house. Lo, here he is. Jesus is here, Josh. What is wrong with you? Why don't you understand this? Why aren't you getting on board? Take the mark. Right? Mm. Praise the Lord that no one who is a believer will or can take that Amen. mark. Amen. But it's going to be as if they would. It's going to be just as convincing whereby, whereby I believe there's probably some that are going to be two seconds away and just be like, whoa, wait a minute, what am I doing? And that's when their head will come off, right? It's going to be such a convincing lie. Glory to God that he has given us the Holy Spirit, which will not allow us to go any further. Why? Because you can't lose Amen. your salvation. Because he promised, first and foremost. Let's just stand on the promises of God. But fear not, little flock. Turn to Psalm chapter 94. Psalm chapter 94. We're reminding you of the fact that God hates those that practice mischief. He hates those that have feet that are swift in running to mischief. And I've just heard of some of these things over the past year. It's just getting exponentially more and more hostile to be a Canadian and to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. Psalm chapter 94 in verse 3. The Bible reads, Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they utter and speak hard things? And all the workers of iniquity boast themselves. They break in pieces thy people. O Lord, they afflict thine heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. Yet they say the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. Verse 16, who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? And I love that verse. Fear not, little flock. Fear not, little flock. Fear not, little flock. Though they are seeking to change times 
and laws. Though they are seeking to frame mischief, though they are seeking to make it illegal to be who you are today when the clock turns over to tomorrow, fear not, little flock. Psalm 94 and verse 17. Psalm 94 and verse 17 says this. It says, Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. Amen. When I said my foot slippeth, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. In the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? They gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn the innocent blood. But the Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock of my refuge. He shall bring upon them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Yea, the Lord, our God, shall cut them off. Glory to God, he will reveal himself in the truth of his wrath, though they frame mischief by a law, though they seek to change times and seasons, as it talks about in Daniel, referring to the end time. We can rest even though they're gathering against us. We can feel comforted even though they're gathering against us, even though they're plotting against us, devising mischief upon their beds. In secret, rather than just throwing javelins, in secret they're framing the mischief. In secret they're forming laws. In secret, I wasn't there when the Supreme Court said this. I wasn't there when all those laws were enacted and things were rolled out into the general populace where doctors would have to follow this law. What's next? Is, is, is security people going to have to follow these laws? What's next? Are, are people that are auto workers going to have to follow these laws? What next? It's just going to keep rolling out and rolling out and rolling out rolling out until what we do every day becomes illegal until what we are as a person in Christ becomes hated and becomes something whereby they can enact their laws against us and practice mischief and have their mischief come out rest as the Bible says he is our defense he is the rock of our refuge and their own iniquity will come upon them we need not worry Christians though the time is close we need not fear though these things are at hand Proverbs 11, verse 27 says, He that seeketh mischief, it shall come unto him. He that seeketh mischief, it shall come unto him. And that's the truth of the scriptures, is that those that have feet, that are swift and running to do such things, those that are framing laws whereby they can trap us and trick us, those that are digging pits before us, they shall fall in them themselves. You're seeking mischief, you're seeking to do mischief to others, Christians need not fear. Those that need to fear are those that are framing the mischief. Those that need to fear are those that are harming Christians. Those that are, need to fear are those that are against the Lord and against His anointing. Why? Because His wrath is swift. And it will come upon them, and so will their own mischief. And the end of them is worse than the beginning, as we already learned about. 